Disruptors, and welcome to another empowering episode of Mindset Mastery Moments. Today, we are diving into a chilling and eye-opening story that exposes the dark side of leadership and the critical importance of transparency, ethical governance. You see, we are going to be diving into a topic we're calling Exposing the Dark Side of Leadership. And we've got a guest that is going to bring us lessons from awesome, impactful book that he wrote that's called Roman Color Crime. In a world where trust and faith are shattered, one book reveals the chilling secrets hidden behind the Roman collar. Roman Color Crime Violated. The Transgressions of a Small Town Priest. You see... Many times as individuals, we tend to trust our leaders and our government and anyone that we follow to do the right thing. But our guest today encourages us in his book. He brought to light the harrowing transgressions of a small town priest in his jaw dropping book that it's called that Roman collar crime. And let me tell you something. I have met our guests, of course, before this, and we've had some conversation around this topic. And I know for some of you are like, well, what does leadership have to do with Roman collar crime, Dr. White? Well, that's exactly what we want to do is to show you the parallel importance of quality leadership through the story that Charles wrote about, which does, as he would share with us, does capture some real life events with a lot of changes in the character. You see, our guest today is none other than Mr. Charles Utter. Mr. Charles Utter, I would invite you to come on up to the Mindset Mastery Moment stage. We can't wait to have you and have you delve into this topic with us today on the dark side of leadership. Well, hello, uh, Alyssa. How are you today? Good to be here. I'm so glad we finally made it to recording your episode. It's been a long time in the waiting, and I know that our guests are going to benefit a lot. But before we get into you, let me just tell the audience a little bit about you and your background. Ladies and gentlemen, Mindset Mastery community, Charles Other has an incredible story to share. He became a victim of a corrupted authority when he and his own girlfriend was victimized by their supposedly devout leader. A small town Catholic priest who turned out to be a con artist, fraudulent investor, and a serial sex abuser. In this book, Charles exposed the dirty secrets of one of the most powerful institutions on the planet. And he makes a compelling case for why we need to radically change our leadership landscape and consider that there is a dark side to leadership and how we truly should protect ourselves and the people that we are responsible for. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, let's give it up for Charles. Sit back and let's delve into this conversation. Charles, welcome, welcome, welcome again. And thank you so much for being here. Very, very happy to be here. So let's delve right in. Charles, in your own words, tell us who you are and how did you get to become the author that you are today? Well, um, (laughs) I don't have, uh, I, I don't think, the most exciting story to tell when it comes to my uh, to my life, uh, I think um, one of the keys is that um, I uh, graduated from college and became a uh, teacher and a coach. And one of my motivating um, things, I guess to say, is that I was determined to never treat kids mm-hmm. like I'd been treated. Right. And that had uh, two components. One, uh, I had, had a difficult father, but this priest uh, was running the school that I went to for the entire time that I went there from uh, elementary school through high school. Mm-hmm. And uh, he just piled on uh, as far as uh, things that I was struggling with uh, in, in life. And so, yeah, it created a determination to uh, have an impact on high school kids uh, and kids in general, mm-hmm. and making sure that they didn't have to uh, deal with an authority figure that was going to be tr- uh, treating them like he had been treated. And that made me a very a positive oriented individual who uh, did everything to build them up uh, right. while at the same time, mm-hmm. um, you know, pointing out and, uh, you know, deficiencies when they were there. Uh, but in a way that was positive rather than disruptive. Mm. And so 
Uh, that that was my start, and um, I uh, probably made a mistake of uh, not staying in the teaching and coaching business mm. because I was pretty good at it. Ah. Uh, I was coach of the year in the in cross country and state of North Dakota at, at age 26. Wow! Uh, so I was you know doing well. I had a great basketball team as well, um, but uh, I got married. My wife is an artist. She wasn't making any money. Um, she's a great artist, though, by the way. She's one of the best. Uh, and it just amazes me that her, her work doesn't sell, but she's a watercolor artist, and so that yeah. makes it even more difficult. But anyway, uh, we just weren't making enough money uh, doing what I was doing. And uh, I actually was in summer school in, at North Dakota State University, and one of my teachers that mm -hmm. summer was the new basketball coach at North Dakota State. And so I asked him, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how much he was making. Mm -hmm. and, and he said $14,000, well, a year. Now that's pittance, that's a pittance. And I was making 10. And I'm thinking, hmm, what is the chance that I'm ever going to get to the level of, you know, a Division II head coach? How much work is that going to take with very little reward? Mm -hmm. You know, and that that really discouraged me. And uh, I applied for a job uh, that I thought was a real advancement uh, that uh, same summer, mm -hmm. and it, I never got it, and that was enough to get me to, to, to move on. And I went into the life insurance business. I did pretty well uh, over the years. I still um, uh, engage in that practice to some degree. Mm -hmm. But in the course of being in business, Mm -hmm. uh, we moved to a new town in Colorado. Mm -hmm. I uh, was very active in the community. Right. And it uh, ended up uh, with um, me being the, um, the uh, creator of the Longmont, Colorado Community Foundation, mm -hmm. which now has $20 million in it and gives out over a million and a half dollars a year to uh, needy people in the, in the community. So mm -hmm. that was kind of the highlight, but I was on parish councils, school boards, uh, you know, community boards, uh, just about anything that you can think of. Right. And um, so that's where my um, greatest impact uh, was community-wise. Then I have seven siblings that are very close. Right. And we would get together every other summer mm -hmm. at some resort area in the in the uh, upper Midwest and the constant, we constantly talked it about at the time, excuse me, we constantly spoke about this priest. Mm. He uh, was the topic of conversation continuously every time we got together, partly because my oldest sister was one of the community members that eventually worked to remove this priest from the community. So she had a lot of inside information Mm -hmm. uh, none of which he was specific to us about because she had uh, pl uh, pl uh, promised to be uh, mm -hmm. uh, confidential about things. But yeah. still, um, we had all experienced the priest in, in much the same way. And he had made an attempt to, to on um, one of my sisters who was smart enough to reject him out right. of hand. <laughs> right. But anyway, so that's somebody said, uh, you know, somebody ought to write a book. And after a while, I decided it was going to be me. And uh, so I did a lot of research. Um, I knew that most of the people that uh, I needed to talk with mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, a lot of his opponents, but a lot of his supporters as well. Mm -hmm. uh, disappointed a lot of people in the community that had been good friends of mine because they didn't think that book should ever be published. Uh, but I felt like it was necessary mm -hmm. so that... Um, Number one, people who were involved in the Catholic Church mm -hmm. would be supported in their uh, need, felt need, to clean up the church. Right. Um, so many priests have been accused of abuse and, and, and things like that. And I frankly think my story is more comprehensive and uh, uh, outlines a greater amount of abuse in, a, in more areas than almost anybody else, at least mm -hmm. anybody that I've read about. Mm. So I think in that sense, 
it uh, will um, be valuable for people in the, especially Catholic community, to read it and uh, support uh, the change that's needed to um, you know, kind of limit the, the, the problem. And, you know, you, you mentioned, I think, uh, either in our discussion before we went on or, or uh, as you came on, that I had an, a, a goal to uh, help really change the church. And I had mentioned that there's really only one change that will be effective in, in changing the church, and that is the change in the higher, higher, hierarchical nature of the catholic church mm -hmm. um, i believe that that hierarchy hierarchy is an anachronism mm -hmm. it doesn't work anymore if it ever did mm -hmm. and that people need to be empowered instead of the hierarchy so I can, I can that's kind of my that. story i love it that you know you're you're on that quest with you know where you think it's crucial that you shed these the light on the dark corners and provide a space of advocacy for a healthier, more transparent leadership environment. Um, and I, I believe that's across the board, not just in the Roman Catholic Church. I mean, of course, I love that you're specific about where you want to see it. But for me personally, I that's just my own personal quest. And um, even in this era, I'm so um I I, tr I I I be I I just keep growing. So I be the I am the change I want to see in the world first, and then the people who I impact and I get to coach or train or even speak to, and even with this podcast, any platform that that's exemplified in character, word, and deed. So I I really can co-sign to that. So Charles, can you share your personal experience with the small town priest and the impact it had on you? And specifically in, in your book, you talk a little bit about the impact it had on you and your girlfriend. What was that like? Well, uh, yeah, that's, uh, might sound, might, might, this might not sound so uh, bad to some people, but to me, uh, because of the mindset that I brought to life because of my relationship with my father, mm -hmm. uh, it had a lot of impact. So I was, um, a pretty good basketball player in high school and I was the only sophomore to make the varsity and I played a lot on the team as a as a varsity player and um, one of the games that I was in as a sophomore uh, I played a, a lot um, because I was shooting very well and coaches being coaches uh, they love the shooter especially when he's making most of the ones that he should, that he attempted. Uh, he put me in the game uh, for an extended period of time as a sophomore. I was not a starter, but uh, uh, that really irritated this priest. And it, this priest used to sit in the stands every game all by himself with a notebook, taking notes about what was going on in the game. And uh, I don't know his ultimate objective, but I think it was to be able to critique the coach. Uh, he was uh, an, pretty on on hand kind of a guy. Uh, did a lot of interfering with the uh, uh, coaching and the teaching that was going on in the school and, and such. So um, after the game was over, mm -hmm. the priest went into the coach's office and he started haranguing him. Mm. about uh, playing some, a, a sophomore and uh, I can't think of the word I don't, that I want to use, but mm -hmm. making him out to be, you know, somebody special when he was just a, just a sophomore. You should never do that to the young, young people, right? Uh, you never want to uplift them too much because they might get a big head. I don't know what the, what the, <laughs> thinking, what the thinking was, but anyway, he tore into the coach, and every all the players heard it because the coach office, coaching office was right next to our locker room. And then the next day, he put up a letter or a message on the school um, um, message board that was right where all the kids walked as they were changing classes, etc., and really knocked me personally and the coach 
uh, and kind of repeated pretty much what he had said during his tirade with the coach after the game. And so after that, I played very little, in, uh, which was totally different than what had existed oh, leading up to yeah. that, that thing. So that was, a, that was a big deal. But probably the biggest thing that happened in my life was um, he forbid what he called going steady uh -huh. with a girl. Mm. And that going steady meant that if you took out a girl three times in a row, you were going steady. Mm. <laughs> and that was prohibited. Oh, wow. And I was kind of a rebel. And, you know, I just uh, uh, was hard to convince that there was anything wrong with that because mm. um, my relationship with my girlfriend was extremely platonic and it stayed that way uh, oh, okay. on a permanent basis until we broke up. Okay. And that had probably more to do with her uh, values than mine, but it was something that uh, uh, I lived with and, and really loved her for. Um, but uh, we were kicked out of school three times. Hmm. Grade, 10th grade, and 12th grade. And we would have been kicked out in 11th grade, but he had a bad car accident and wasn't in school for the entire year. Oh, wow. So we got to keep, stay in school our entire junior year of school. Wow. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that was the kind of thing that uh, we were putting up with. And then uh, here's my suspicion. And I hope she doesn't hear this, be honest with you, because it's only a suspicion. But uh, when I was disciplined, I was taken into his office in the school mm -hmm. and re read the riot act. Mm -hmm. When she was disciplined, she was called into his office in his home. Mm -hmm. And so they were there alone. Mm -hmm. And about uh, on our freshman year of college, after being extremely close for four years, mm -hmm. uh, when I went to see her one time, she wouldn't talk to me. And I had, I had traveled several hundred miles to go see her. Uh, I was in college and she was at a different school. And uh, I would quiz her as to what was wrong. And then finally she said, well, we're breaking up. Hmm. No explanation, no amplification, no nothing. Just we're breaking up. And that was it. Mm -hmm. And I interpreted that as her not wanting to tell me what had happened to her. Mm -hmm. with the priest mm. because she as i said uh we are committed to to a, 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 a pure relationship mm -hmm. and a platonic relationship and i think he raped her mm. and uh, to compound that later on she uh enticed my, one of my best friends both of our best friends from high school Uh -huh. uh, into having sex with her. That was after about two years of college. So here's a platonic relationship that went five years almost. And now all of a sudden she's enticing uh, a best friend to have sex. What does that mean? I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, that happened. And um, so where did it come from? Right. And then she left the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And went into a very fundamentalist Christian. I, I think it's a Christian scientist. Oh. I can't think. Of, I'm not sure of that, but it's one where they're very rigid. And and uh, she was uh, uh, kind of an evangelical. She was after her family, alienated her family, uh, trying to convert every one of them. And she had, I think, seven brothers and sisters, too. Oh, wow. <laughs> anyway, we had big families back in those days. Right. Uh, but anyway, so that that was you know, the way I, I was impacted uh, and one of the things that motivated the writing of the book. Okay, that sounds, wow, that's interesting. What are some of the most shocking revelations you uncovered during the investigation that you did for the book? Well, that's a, that's a tough one, you know, 
the lot of what I uncovered really had been uncovered in rumors when we were kids because mm -hmm. people observed this priest doing things uh, mm -hmm. and we talked about him. Mm -hmm. uh, our parents forbid us from go gossiping about the priest, but we did it, you know, with each other. Right. Uh, so I, I knew a lot of the stuff that had been going on, mm -hmm. but you know, and then my sister was so uh, critically involved as well. So uh, she, uh, I can't really be specific about any one thing that I learned from her, but it was a lot of stuff. Right. Um, one of the really key factors in his success in perpetrating so much of his you know, sexual activity uh, with, with women mm -hmm. and, and young girls, actually, mm -hmm. uh, was that he had uh, taken money out of the offertory and invested it mm. uh, extremely well. Mm. Um, he actually initially invested in a, uh, um, a uh, oil field uh, investment in Alaska mm -hmm. under the auspices of John Kennedy or Joseph Kennedy, John mm -hmm. Kennedy's father. Oh, wow. And he made a lot of money in that investment. Wow. And when he got out of that, um, he uh, went into the real estate business. Mm. Uh, I'm sorry. And the second thing that he did is he invested his money with mm -hmm. G G.D. Searle and company, the mm -hmm. creator of the birth control pill. Oh, wow. So here's a path Catholic priest investing in the company that creates the birth control pill. And, you know, you could guess, since we were fairly rigid Catholics, we went to confession frequently. And so sexual sins were fairly, you know, they had to be very comp uh, common. Mm -hmm. And so the women that were having what they thought was illicit sex or, 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 or uh, actually um, uh, doing uh, birth control, which mm -hmm. was a sin in the in the Catholic Church at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, anything other than natural birth control was wrong and was right. confessed, I'm sure. So he knew, you know, how big this was. Mm -hmm. And so his investment in G.D. Searle and company tripled his money in just three years. Wow. Then uh, he had a, a associate, a uh, friend who he had gone to the uh, to the uh, priesthood with to the uh, uh, and uh, who ended up being the um, uh, financial manager of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles mm -hmm. and uh, they knew Kennedy very well because Kennedy had been a personal friend of Pope Pius XII okay. and so he knew a lot of the bishops including the bishop at uh, the Archdiocese of Los Angeles and he was uh, giving his or the, the uh, priest there, the the uh, um, the one that was running the finances for the diocese, was giving the trades uh -huh. that they uh, had learned about real estate trades to Kennedy, who was then uh, ended up in the uh, hands of the priest as well. Mm -hmm. So through his who through his friend in the archdiocese of Los Angeles, he was able to build a huge uh, real estate dynasty, and he, he ended up with twelve hotels in his estate and about two and a half million dollars in securities. So um, then of course he used that money to um, uh, romance those who are uh, um, ended up being, being his victims. Um, he was notified, noted for being gone for long periods of time. And, and uh, typically we learned that a lot of those times he was with one of his girls. And um, I'm probably maybe getting ahead of myself here, but one, of my high school basketball coaches had uh, seven kids and a wife who was a nurse. And uh, I'd mentioned that he was out of school for a whole year at one time after a car accident. One of, so, what, but the nurse that took care of him was the wife of this coach. And they immediately began a relationship that actually lasted for 15 years. And we hear stories about him um, driving significant distances to to see her after of course uh, she had left the community and uh, spending significant amounts of money uh, taking her out and what have you and uh, the police one time uh, stopped him for speeding 
Uh, he was a notorious speeder, by the way. We loved going to basketball games with him because he always went so fast. But uh, uh, he was picked up for speeding, and uh, they checked his car for some reason, opened it, had him open his trunk, and there were grocery bags of cash in his trunk. Oh, wow. That was one occasion, but it happened more than once. Uh, and another one of his victims was a... Uh, recent graduate of the school that he uh, ran that uh, decided to become a nun. And he would take a personal interest in all of the girls that wanted to be nuns. And he took her on a trip, a rewards trip, to one of his hotels in Disneyland. And that's where he uh, attempted to have sex with her. I think she resisted it, but anyway, on the way there, uh, he drove. He, he didn't like to fly. Uh, and that was in the early days of, of uh, you know, uh, flights as well. Anyway, so uh, they drove from uh, this little town in North Dakota all the way out to California to his hotels. And on the way, they stopped to eat. And she witnessed him opening his trunk and taking the cash out that was needed uh, from these grocery bags of cash to, to pay for their meals. So... Um, that was one of the revelations, his extreme wealth. Um, when he died, and you can see, you can look this up if you had his first real name, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, it's online. His estate was extremely large, and there was a uh, uh, some litigation that took 10 years based on a, uh, a document that was poorly drafted, and uh, they the trustees went to uh, court, and uh, during that 10 years, uh, the uh, IRS was constantly interfering in the in the motel business, and so their business went to heck, and their values in their, their uh, uh, sale values went way down. So $25 million became $18 million, and that was about the, the, uh, the, uh, the state tax that was assessed. So he had an $18 million estate tax liability and they couldn't sell the real estate for what they needed to pay the tax. And so the estate is still open. And so you can you can see all of the details about his estate by going online and uh, just Googling uh, his, this priest's estate. You could, you could probably come up with a couple of other ways of finding it as well. But um, so that, that was uh, uh, the result of his accumulation and getting advice that was extremely poor uh, that caused him to uh, to lose uh, his entire estate. So that was one of one of the things was was the money uh, situation. But one of the things that he did with his money, which was really impactful in the community, was that he went out and uh, or uh, hired rock star athletic coaches. And so I had the for good fortune of being coached by some of the best coaches in the high school coaches in the country. He would go out and pay inordinate, inordinate amounts of money to get these coaches to come to a small town. Um, my high school uh, football coach, he's actually uh, there when I was a, a ninth grader, was named Ron Earhart. Ron Earhart started his first head coaching job in a school of 250 kids in a town of less than a thousand people. And he eventually became the head football coach of the New England Patriots. That's the quality of the coaches. My two high school basketball coaches, one was his cousin who had a great reputation in Montana as a basketball player and early on as a coach, paid him a bunch of money to come to our school and then started sleeping with his wife. And that coach got so upset that, well, he, he actually caught them one time. And he had a, a gun in his garage. He went out to get the gun. The priest, you know, fled to his home. And when the wife saw that uh, her husband had gotten a gun, she called the cops. And it's a small town. So... The coach 
got to the priest's house at about the same time as the cop did, but he was going to kill him. Mm. The cop was, of course, able to talk him out of it, and so he lived on. Mm. But he, he, of course, he would, he left, and they got divorced. And unfortunately, it was a very unfortunate thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he became a, a president of a, a junior college in Montana. He was an outstanding guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other, the next coach was the had the best record in both football and basketball, high school, in the history of the state of Montana. And I won't go into detail on how he uh, found this person and how he uh, attracted it, um, other than he gave him big money to bring him into the school. And that's the coach whose w- uh, wife ended up having this relationship with him. And that was a tragedy in itself. And uh, another book could be written about the impact on uh, that that had on his family. Right. So uh, he had money and he had power um, and he used his his uh, image of, as a priest to um, create relationships in the community. He broke up uh, at least five marriages in the community. Um, a lot of those people wouldn't talk when mm. I when I, when I uh, you know did my research. Mm. Uh, the one, the one girl that uh, became was went to become a nun, and, and uh, it, who was abused by him, talked to me for a while, uh, but then she got so upset about things that she couldn't talk anymore. So you mm. can get, you can uh, uh, begin to understand the impact that it had on these people. Right. Um, it was very, it's just very interesting. So, um, not thinking. Uh, uh, it's a lot of corruption. That's a lot yeah. of corruption. So you get the essence of what what uh, of what's really all of the issues. Yeah. So when we talk about you know taking it on the broader spectrum in a more whole generalistic view, if you can share with us what you think the broader implication of corruption within a religious institution, how does that really affect the, the, the parishioners and people in general? When we think broadly, how does I mean? Because obviously, I'm pretty sure that. While this case may come across as an isolated incident, there's still a general undertone of a level of corruption that does transpire within religious institutions. So, what do you think the implications of this sort of corruption is? On on on. Well, the- I think you know people are leaving the churches, churches, church in droves. Um, I just saw a statistic uh, recently that uh, in the '60s. Seventy-five mm-hmm. percent of people who called themselves Catholics went to church every Sunday. Mm. That, that number is down to forty percent. Wow! And uh, more re- more connected to my book, mm-hmm. the kids that went to that high school mm-hmm. almost all fell away from the church. Oh wow! Mm. I mean, it was it was rampant. Mm. Um, so none of the people that you that uh that I was acquainted with, not none of them, there's some that stayed, uh, but they left. And so that's the impact of this kind of thing is, is people just lose confidence in the church. And they say to themselves, if this is what I believe, and it pro- it's proven not to be true, what mm-hmm. else is not true? And mm-hmm. they just walk away from, from uh, God entirely. Right. They become totally skeptical about organized religion Right, and that, definitely. You probably understand that once you do that, it's very l- difficult to become personally engaged uh, right. with your God. Um, I was fortunate to found a, a prayer practice. Uh, well, let me just back up a little bit. Well, I was uh, I taught uh, five years in a Catholic school, and mm-hmm. during that t- entire time, I was an atheist, and it was, <laughs> it was because I had gone through all of this and this uh-huh. with this priest. Uh-huh. Um, and so, uh, down the, down the road, you know, I f- started figuring it had to be a lot more to life than what I was experiencing. And I started looking again, and I came across something called Centering Prayer, which is a, a uh, spiritual practice that was created by a priest uh, called, uh, named uh, Thomas Keating, mm. and that brought me back to God. And mm-hmm. I am so thankful for that because it's mm-hmm. it's transformed my life. In addition to bring you back to God, it's made me a, a much better person. And right. so uh, I, I was lucky, but that not everybody is lucky like that. Uh, not everybody is uh, I agree. Um, 
I guess, as uh, eager to get back to something in a spiritual sense. So I agree. So when when you think about the, all this, and you know, I I feel like that's what I love our topic, and you know. I th what do you think are the factors that allow corruption to thrive within trusted institutions, not just in a religious institution, but in general? What do you think are those key factors that allow corruption to thrive in trusted into, into institutions across the board? Well, I, I think as far as uh, the churches are concerned, they prize their image more than anything. And whenever something like uh, I wrote about gets out in the, in the news, mm -hmm. it, it tends to destroy their image. Mm. So when somebody comes to a pastor with uh, a problem with another priest, for example, mm -hmm. or goes to a bishop about a priest, right. uh, the first thing they think about is, oh, my God, this is awful. We can't let this get out in public. You can't let it because it'll it. it'll hurt the church. Okay, gotcha. And and, and that's really the the essence of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Catholic Church is reportedly doing a better job of of uh, uh, interviewing candidates for the priesthood so that they can avoid bringing those types of people aboard. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, I think the essence of the problem was not only the fact that the church was hiding the problem, but it was that they were recruiting uh, individuals who f saw that as a place that would give them access mm. to the kids, mm. so that they could and and that would then protect them from what they would be perpetrating right. on those right. kids. It's a safe so. harbor instead of there is no um, proper chain of accountability, and because of the the, the the thoughtful need of how does this affect us if it came out so those chains of accountability has not been created and so it is becomes more or less without saying a safe harbor for what i would say criminal minds <laughs> um, because again you can have a, a good solid interviewing process and i say to people you know like when we think of like a, a, a sexual Register, uh, sexual offender registry, sexual predator registry. These things are are helpful, but they a person is not on that registry until they are caught and gone through a trial and been proven to be guilty of said crimes. So in the meantime, there are people who have not been caught yet, still getting away with it. But if we had a a system inside that says if this happened, you are safe enough to say this happened to me and I and I got hurt by this person, whether it was a financial crime or a sexual crime or whatever that looks like. If the let's just, for example, say the religious institutions were able to say there is an accountability process and we have zero tolerance. So, yes. And then the families inside these institutions were like i you know you're always safe to let me know what happened i will listen to you i will go i will help you then it will be easier it's easier than saying that will set a system then okay here comes charles's girlfriend you're a liar there's no way father elisa will do <laughs> would do such and such there's no way you know and so that system the the anti-venom is going to be tackling it head on it's not going to be if you're not creating a space for people to come forward then you're creating a space to cover it up and it's yeah. really that simple so when i think of trusted institutions and i'm listening to what you're saying i'm like what are the 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 the, the, the tiers of accountability and what is the process of weeding it out like you said to start from interviewing that's good but I don't know you're a criminal until you create a criminal act that I found out about. So then I, you know, someone might be like, oh, Father Elisa is well recommended from all these other par parishes she's been to. She's got a great track record. But now something's happened with her, even mentally. And now she's perpetrating acts on young people or inside this institution. 
that is not less than anything she's been before, but now it is. So if you have an accountability space, then the, the ones who are set up to think and be that way won't necessarily get to come in and cause as much damage as this particular priest did. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So I feel like, you know, when it comes to corruption, you have to have an anti-corruption plan. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I agree. And quite frankly, I'm not sure um, uh, where the uh, church is on that uh, point. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I know that they've done uh, a better job of, of uh, preventive um, uh, recruitment, I guess. Uh, because the reported incidences are going down significantly. Um, I think, though, that Modern communication has more to do that, with that than anything else. Mm. Uh, in the old days, you could uh, hide things pretty easily because the average person could only spread the word through newspapers and face letters. To face. Yeah, and face, yeah, to, face, face to face. Yeah. And uh, nowadays, uh, information explodes around the world before you can count to 10. You know? so, <laughs> right, right. So, uh, I agree. Yeah. So how well, did the community react when when all the revela revelations came to light? Because that would be that era of accountability, right? If there, yeah, what well, I can tell you what reaction? happened to my uh, what happened to my sister. She was uh, married to a very successful farmer, and they had all kinds of friends. She was very active in the parish, and she had graduated from the high school, and. Um, she was, because she was so active in the community, one of the assistant priests who decided that it was time to expose this this priest, mm -hmm. came to her and asked her to be on a committee that would approach the bishop. And so she agreed to do that. Mm. And as she learned about uh, all the things that are going on and they began to put pressure on the priest, she began to lose her friend. If you read the book, uh, the headings on each one of the chapters is a uh, quote from the Sunday Bulletin that he wrote himself. And those quotes will tell you more about who this priest was than mm -hmm. anything that I could describe. Mm -hmm. uh, but what it also tells you is that he was the efforts okay. that these people were making Mm -hmm. to get rid of him. And he had built this school into such a sports uh, uh, powerhouse mm -hmm. uh, that the people absolutely loved him. They wouldn't believe a word of any of this negative uh, uh, information about him. And so uh, they, good friends of hers, uh, just dropped her as, as, as a friend. And they actually um, got to the point where they couldn't stand living in the community anymore. And he sold his farm, which was a significant sized uh, farm, and moved his entire operation to, to South Dakota and mm -hmm. started afresh down there. So they were basically run out of the community uh, because they had been working to to uh, get rid of this priest. Right. So, Charles, I have a question for you on the broader scale. What steps do you think organizations can truly put into place to um, protect themselves or even handling narcissistic type leadership in these institutions? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I haven't uh, you know, been involved in a lot of uh, you know these activities in recent times. I spent so much time in volunteering when I was younger that I've decided I pretty much uh, did my duty, <laughs> taking a break. But, <laughs> but uh, um, if you belong to an organization that has a uh, board, uh, and I would uh, encourage you to become a member of that board. And when you are evaluating uh, people to work in that organization, that you develop a questionnaire that will help determine, you know, what their attitude is about, you know, you know, moral 
the moral strictures, okay? And, you know, that would be one thing. I'm not sure right off the top of my head whether that would be immediately effective or how long it would take to develop some kind of a tool like that to, to really be able to get at the essence of the issues and make sure that that you can effectively find the people that would be bad actors. I don't know if you could do that. That would be difficult, I think. Uh, but it's certainly something that should be in the uh, in the mix as far as uh, uh, you know recruitment into organizations. Um, but you know, how do you know uh, the secrets that uh, that uh, are hidden uh, behind the curtain? You know, you just don't until mm -hmm. they start to act out. Mm -hmm. And of course. If you're an organization that uh, finds out that your people are a person uh, or people are acting out that way, uh, obviously you need to have uh, uh, policies that uh, enable you to get rid of them. So, Right. I want to just uh, jump in a little bit to something you talk about, and that's blind faith. Um, one of the things that I, when we met in our pre-interview um, um meeting we you shared a lot about something that would apply to not just religious institutions of course i feel personally mostly religious institutions but generally speaking um we look at uh influencers and anyone who i would say is in some sort of a, a position of authority and we we kind of as humans put this blind fate in there how can we replace blind faith with a more critical and healthy approach to organizational loyalty? Because obviously I believe that's one of the things why someone would say, you're lying. There's no way Father Elisa did that. <laughs> There's no way because of that blind faith and that loyalty. How can we truly replace that with a more healthy type of approach and still be loyal to the organizations we serve in and the leaders we serve with? Well, you know, uh, when it comes to religion, mm -hmm. um, blind faith uh, it comes into play mostly with the those who represent the institution of religion. Mm. Um, it would be nice if the masses could have blind faith in God. <laughs> but that's so true. That's well, much more difficult. Than having blind faith in the institution. In fact, uh, I think one of the difficulties in religion is the the, in, the inability of people to master a, 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 re, a relationship with God independent of an institution yeah. that gives them the guidance. I agree. Uh, and so, um, the blind faith in a priest, as an example, uh, is something that kind of becomes a substitute for really understanding uh, what God is, who God is, mm -hmm. uh, his uh, direction to his people to love each other as he has loved us. Mm -hmm. um, is that so difficult uh, to learn to accept uh, the circumstances of life as part of God's plan? And to deal with them in a way that uh, make moves you closer to God rather than questioning God. Uh, these are all the personal side of, of, of faith. Whereas if you don't have that structure that allows you to do that, you depend on instruction from the priest or the pastor. And if you begin to believe blindly in what they tell you, then you've elevated them to a godlike place, which enables them to be anybody they want. I mean, most of them are worthy of, uh, you know, that kind of, uh, of uh, respect, but some aren't. And it's the ones that aren't, that take advantage of people's blind faith where the problem lies. And so, um, you know, I think it's just an overall kind of, uh, of, uh, a message that everyone, every religion should give to its community that uh, there should not be blind faith in the institution, but that they should try to learn and create a personal relationship with 
God, right. which is the essence of uh, of all religion and of all faith. Yes, I love it. Well said. Well said. I, I can't emphasize more. Um, the importance of what you said is having a relationship with God and the Creator. That is a relationship with God, the Creator, and then understanding that a religious institution or a religious leader is just an accessory to that relationship that you've already established. And so I hope our viewers and listeners are catching that because that's so important. It would be one of the major ways that now when you have a direct relationship with the source of everything, the one who created, the one who enabled us to even have a church or a church leader, a priest or whatever, then we understand that we don't trust them to be perfect. And if they're not, it's okay. It's just that what they do, how it affects us, we still have to filter out and remove or retain them or even sometimes re, you know, re-engage them. But it's like when I think of the blind faith, it's if you are sure of who you are and you know what you believe and who you believe in then what another person does will not will not be trusted without it being tested right sure. so fate you know it's one thing and you said it's so easy for us humans to trust another humans that's because we're living by our sight and our senses right and even in the bible it says you know we walk by faith not by sight and that you know we keep our eyes fixed on god right and so when you do that, then it's through those lenses, you get to see individuals and institutions, and then you're able to decipher, this is just not right. <laughs> and so you take a stand. And so I, the question I'm going to throw at you here with that is, how are you perceived for even writing this book? Because obviously, you have done some things um, to create um, privacy and ambiguity in the process of publishing this material, but there's still so much, how are you perceived by your community? For well, I think the best way to, to determine that is to look at the reviews. They're all uh, um, just uh, complimentary as can be. <laughs> right. but, um, here's the, what the situation was. Mm -hmm. Most of the people who read this book uh, were, oh, well, I shouldn't say most of the people, initially at least, were people who had lived it who had grown up in that community, who mm -hmm. had gone to that school. And they absolutely loved that book. Mm -hmm. And there were some, some of the older people in the community that were still loyal, uh, you know, bl had blind faith in the priesthood, mm -hmm. who were really upset. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the people who uh, were closest to him when he was there were the mm -hmm. most upset about me writing this book. But that was a that was a very small number because even those who, who uh, loved the priest and thought he was God himself, uh, you know, began to realize over time right. with all the chaos that was going on in the community as he was being removed uh, that you know there was some something to the stories, yeah. and so, but yeah, it was uh, universally praised by most of the kids that had gr grown up in that community and gone to that school. It was a boarding school, too, by the way. So this included people that were not from the community. They were from all areas, uh, surrounding areas as well. Other states, Montana. This was a North Dakota uh, story. Uh, mm -hmm. But people in Minnesota, South Dakota, Montana, uh, all had representation of, uh, in that school. And so this story was spread throughout that whole area initially. Right. Right. And uh, Yeah. Wow. So before we go to wrap up the episode, I want to ask you, what qualities do you believe are essential for cultivating healthy leaders in the future, given all that you've uncovered in this in this uh, story, real life story in your book? What qualities do you believe are just essential for us to have healthy leadership in the future? Well, you have to have, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, competence and that's probably the wrong place to start but uh, mm -hmm. um, you know well educated competence it it, it uh, dictates how we find these people 
Uh, but then once we find those that are competent, we need to check their uh, level of honesty. Okay. Mm. We had to, we have to determine whether or not they're willing to communicate uh, negative issues. And we also need to determine whether they are able to discuss uh, uh, these issues, even though they might feel victimized. Mm. And so it's really great communicators can become great leaders as long as they are honest and straightforward with uh, the issues. True. And of course, it doesn't hurt to them for them to have a great moral education. Mm -hmm. And so I love private schools, Christian schools, Catholic schools, because they get a, get a daily um, measure of, of morality. Mm -hmm. And I think that is so important. Mm -hmm. Now, in the old days, we were afraid of sin because we would be condemned. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not so much a part of the, the equation anymore, but we need to teach people to be able to, to open up to God because you will get the guidance you need mm -hmm. without the fear of uh, retaliation for sin. I agree. I don't know. That that's my that's my idea of a of a great um, great way public of, servant. I agree. I like it. So we're going to be right back after a word from our sponsors, and we will have mindset bites to go with uh, Mr. Charles Utter. Disruptors, and we're back. Uh, in the, we had a wonderful enlightenment conversation with our dear guest here, Mr. Charles Utter, on the topic of leadership from a perspective that many of us never think about. And the topic today is exposing the dark side of leadership lessons learned from a Roman collar crime, written by our dear guest, Charles Utter. And so, we want to share a brief bit about his book. Here in the segment, um, for those who are watching on YouTube, you get to see a little bit more theatrics, but the ones listening, you'll learn more about the book. And here in a bit, Charles is going to tell us how to get your copy and dive into the story and make your own conclusions and also be enlightened on your journey of establishing trust in a healthy way with leadership and Charles would say specifically in religious institutions. So just hang back as we show you a... Uh, a sizzle reel of Charles's book. In a world where trust and faith are shattered, one book reveals the chilling secrets hidden behind the Roman collar. Roman collar crime violated the transgressions of a small town priest. Uncover the horrifying truth of a priest who used his power to exploit innocent souls. Follow the brave survivors as they seek justice in the face of darkness. But amidst the shadows, a sports empire thrives, creating a facade of righteousness. Meet Father Joe Brennan, a man of contradictions. As secrets unravel and tensions mount, one question remains. Can the truth prevail? Witness the unforgettable moments that will leave you breathless. Are you ready to face the darkness that hides beneath the collar? Roman Collar Crime Violated The Transgressions of a Small Town Priest Available now Get your copy and discover the shocking story. And there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Forever. That is the sizzle rule to the book. So exciting. Um, if uh, if you're interested in unlocking and then following along in the story and the journey and the outcomes, we're not going to give you any spoilers here in the episode. But however, today I get to give the microphone to you, Charles, to give a 90 to um, 120 second 
um, what you want the viewers and listeners to know and learn about you, the book, and what you want them to take away from the lessons you've learned on the journey to not only as a person who would have gone through the experience and lived through it, but overcame it and found your way back again. What kind of mindset did that take for you? And where would you like to encourage our viewers and listeners to go next? Charles, the microphone is yours. Well, um, you know, I don't think I have anything all that uh, fantastic to uh, talk about. But, uh, you know, I was uh, just a, a small town kid, uh, grew up in a situation that was uh, maybe not unique, but it was very, it was, was, uh, uh, really impactful and um, I think what that uh, did to me was uh, initially kind of give me a uh, kind of a no care attitude. Um, I uh, went off to college uh, as I graduated from that high school and uh, I decided I was there to have fun even though it was a private school it was, and my parents were paying and it was expensive uh, even in those days. Um, um, and uh, just got enough, uh, good enough grades to get by and then I uh, got out of college and I got lucky and got a job with a former uh, teacher of mine who uh, remembered me from high school and, uh, and, and that's where things kind of change. Um, because the reason I went into teaching was I wanted to make sure that uh, I could influence as many pe kids as possible and treat them in a way uh, and avoid treating them in a ways that I had been treated. And that meant instead of being negative, I would build them up uh, and I would take into account their, their uh, failings, but build them up and encourage them that they could work on those failings and become a better people. Then when I, uh, got out of college, as I had mentioned earlier, I was faced with having to make it on my own in, in business. And I took that a similar attitude uh, into the community because, you know, in, in one sense, it was a little bit selfish because I moved into a community that nobody knew me. And so my way of getting known, known was to get involved in the community. Um, get to know people so that they would do business with me. But that had a positive e a, a effect as well, because I ended up uh, being instrumental in uh, doing a lot of good in the community. As I mentioned, I had created the foundation. Um, it's still going. They're still raising money. It's still influential, influential in the community. And, I, and that thing started in 1990, so it's a permanent institution that wouldn't be there if I hadn't done it. I got involved as uh, uh, on community boards and commissions. I ran for city council, um, all with the idea of making my community a better place to live. I started a foundation for my parish and uh, worked hard to get it off the ground. Uh, and then uh, I became uh, a member of the school board, the Catholic school board and the parish council and uh, other boards and commissions in, in the community. And all with the idea that what needed to be done was action that would improve the community and give it a better opportunity to, to thrive. And so that's really what I would uh, say to those out there who uh, are interested, that is, be active. Take your time. Make your community a better place. Make your church a better place. Um, and as you do that, uh, you begin to get uh, uh, grounded in that community and become appreciated in that, that community and all good things come from that. So uh, that would be my primary uh, recommendation for anybody who's watching. Thank you so much, Charles. That's oh, so thank you so much for that. That's very positive. So I want to ask you, Charles, how do we connect with you and how do we get a copy of your book? Well, the book is available on Amazon and on um, 
What's the other one? Barnes and Noble, I think. Barnes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and Barnes and Noble, but both online. Yeah. Uh, now, I have been guilty of not promoting the book as, as much as I probably should have. And so uh, it's not in many libraries, although um, there is one library that buys books periodically, it happens to be located in Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, but uh, uh, primarily, you can get the book by going to Amazon. And I, I do want to mention this, though. If anybody would like to read this book, uh, have their book club uh, read this book, um, I put my email address in the uh, chat box. Let me know, and I will make sure that you can get a supply of books at a discount. Yes. We will have so, your contact information wherever you're watching this. It's right. Yeah. And what I'll do is I will um, buy the books and mail them uh, in, a, in bulk to uh, the leader of the, of the uh, 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 book club. Awesome. That's a free, wonderful gift um, that he's giving us the opportunity to receive a discount for a book club for those who are listening around the world. Charles, I've got to say thank you so much for your time, your insights. It's been an enlightenment to hear your story and the lessons that you've shared um, that so many of us can take from. Uh, we encourage you again to check out the, um, you know, the links below so you can connect with Charles. Listeners, be sure to check out his book. It's called Roman Color Crime, The Transgressions of a Small Town Priest. And take more in-depth and insights into the journey with him. Um, we are reminding you to go ahead, like, share, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to this. Get the word out as we bring. The more you share, the more you subscribe, the more you rate us, the more we're able to bring these uh, these wonderful guests. And if you'd like to also be uh, there's a link in the description if you'd like to support our podcast please go ahead and and do that and let's get ready and remember to how we think is what we speak what we do what we become remember that your mindset is the key to your success thank you so much charles thank you listeners and viewers from around the world and we say we're over and out see you in the next episode of mindset mastery moments thank you thank you much Alyssa. bye now